Now here's a question for you. If you're standing on the equator and you weigh X number of pounds of weight, and then you move to the North Pole and you stand up here at the North Pole and weigh yourself again, would you have exactly the same weight or would you weigh slightly different if you're on the equator versus the pole? Now the answer to this is yes, you actually would measure and you would actually have a different weight on the equator versus the pole. And to understand why, we have to talk about the rotation of the Earth. Now there's two main reasons for this. Now we think of the Earth as this perfect sphere, but actually as it's rotating, it's slightly bulged in the center, in the mid area here, as compared to the uh, top there, the poles. So actually, the farther away you are at the equator from the center of the Earth, because it's bulging, is one of the reasons why you're going to weigh less there. The other reason is due to the forces because of the rotation of the planet. Now we don't feel it, but the Earth is actually at the equator rotating tangentially at about a thousand miles per hour. That's really, really fast. But notice that that speed is maximum if you're standing on the equator. As you move more and more and more and more north, all the way up to the North Pole, eventually if you're standing right here on the North Pole and the Earth is rotating, you would just be kind of looking up at the sky, rotating in a tiny circle around your feet, and you wouldn't be really moving very fast, just a pure rotation about your Axis. So maximum speed at the equator and zero speed, tangential speed, standing on the North Pole. So as we're riding around on the surface of the planet at the equator at a thousand miles an hour, we have a constant tendency to want to travel in a straight line away from the surface of the planet. That's the law of inertia. And so what that means is we're tending to be flung away from the planet all the time. Now this tendency to be flung away from the planet shows up as what's called a fictitious force, called the centrifugal force. It's not a real force, it's just the tendency of everything to travel in a straight line away from the surface of the planet trying to be flung away. It's highest at the equator because the rotational speed is highest at the equator, and it's zero at the poles of the planet. Now this counteracting force opposite of gravity tends to make you feel lighter at the equator. So a 200 pound person measuring their weight at the poles would actually be about 5% lighter or about 199 pounds at the equator. Now I know you've heard of voltage in electric circuits. There's voltage, there's current, and there's resistance. So you've heard of voltage. And so you may have heard of the term voltage drop. You may have heard of the term potential difference in a circuit. I wanna talk about those terms and explain what exactly is a voltage drop and how is that different from the general concept of voltage. So voltage is actually really similar to the concept of potential energy in physics. Here's a mountain here, and you know that if you're at the top of the mountain, you have more potential energy. Because if you throw a rock off the top of the mountain, it will accelerate all the way down, picking up speed, and then crashing into the bottom as it gains kinetic energy. But when you measure that potential energy from the top of the mountain, you're always measuring it relative to something. Usually you're measuring it relative to the bottom of the surrounding uh, landscape there, but you might be measuring it with respect to sea level or something else. In other words, the top of the mountain means absolutely nothing unless you specify how far above the ground that is. So if you're at the top of the mountain, you have maximum potential energy uh, difference between the top and the ground. If you walk halfway down the mountain, you don't have as much potential energy, uh, but you do still have some relative to the ground. And if you get a little bit above the ground, you have even less potential energy relative to the ground. As you walk from the top to the bottom, your potential difference or potential energy is decreasing all the way to zero when you actually get to the bottom. When you get to the bottom, you have no more potential energy difference anymore. Now a battery is actually a potential energy storage device. So when you hear the term potential difference in circuits, it means the potential energy difference between two points. So from both sides of this battery, there is a potential energy stored. It pushes the electrons out, almost like falling down the mountain, and then it goes through element number one, then element number two, then element number three. And when you get all the way back down to the bottom of the mountain, you don't have any potential 
uh, energy anymore. The battery then, the chemical reaction then, accelerates the electrons again out the circuit going around and around. So you need to start thinking of this battery as a mountain. And as you go down the mountain, you lose some potential. You lose some potential energy and lose the last bit of the potential energy when you make it back. So let's say the total potential energy across this battery, the voltage drop is 10 volts. Then across each element, if you measure it with a meter across each element, you will measure an independent voltage drop. But all three of these voltage drops have to add up to, in this case, 10 volts, because that's the total potential energy of this situation. Here's a question for you. What exactly is a sonic boom and what happens when a plane breaks the sound barrier and goes faster than the speed of sound? Well, the sonic boom itself is actually a loud booming sound or a sort of like a sound of thunder that emanates from the surfaces of an airplane traveling faster than the speed of sound. Now, surprisingly, for a long time, I actually thought that the sonic boom was something that sort of happens like right when the airplane goes through the speed of sound, boom, and it was like a one-time thing, like you break through this uh, sound barrier and it's a one-time event. But actually, the sonic boom is something that's happening all the time once the airplane is traveling faster than the speed of sound. And what I mean by that is if you have two observers on the ground, let's say they're like 10 miles apart, and the airplane is flying overhead, and the airplane is traveling faster than the speed of sound in the air at that altitude and that temperature, then as the plane flies over observer one, he will hear a sonic boom. And as the plane continues and then passes observer number two, he will hear a sonic boom. And so as people are on the ground in a straight line underneath the airplane or to the, just to the side of the airplane, they will each hear a very loud booming sound as the plane flies overhead. But you want to know who does not hear a sonic boom in the cockpit? It's actually the pilot. The pilot never hears a sonic boom because the plane is traveling faster than the speed of sound, so the airplane is out ahead in front of what is called the shock wave. So as an airplane flies and goes faster and faster, they have more and more drag because they're encountering the air as it's pushing into the air. And the air begins to get compressed and also gets heated on the leading surfaces of the wings. Now, eventually, you reach kind of a critical, uh, a critical value of velocity where when you go faster and faster, you get more and more drag culminating at the local speed of sound in the atmosphere. And what ends up happening is a shock wave. And you can kind of see that happening here. It's often accompanied by condensation because the water molecules are compressed together and also condensing just outside of what's called the mock cone, which is a conical section coming away from the airplane. Now, the reason they thought it was a sound barrier is because as pilots pushed uh, harder and closer and closer to the speed of sound, the drag got so bad that the airplanes became unstable and many of them actually broke apart in flight. Now, this is the Bell X-1, the first aircraft to go faster than the speed of sound. You know how they did it? They made the shape of this aircraft the same as the shape of a bullet that we already knew can travel faster than the speed of sound. So these early airplanes were shaped like bullets. I want to talk today about the difference between energy and power. You have everyday experience talking about both of these, and most people think they're exactly the same thing, but they're not. They're totally different quantities. So we're going to say this a few times to make sure it sinks in. I want you to think of energy as the capacity to do work, to make a change in the world, to move something. So energy is the quantity of something necessary to effectuate some sort of work. But power is how fast the energy is taking place over. In other words, power is energy flow per unit time. So whereas energy is how much capacity you have to make some change in the world, do some work, the power incorporates the concept of time and how fast the energy is used or dissipated. I want you to start to think of energy as the amount of liquid level in a glass of water. The quantity of the water that you have represents the amount of energy you have to make some change in the world. But how fast you pour it from the glass, you could dribble it out very slowly. That would be a low power because the energy is being drained very slowly. Or if you dump it out really fast, you would have a very high power output because you're dumping the energy out very, very fast per unit time. So again, energy is measured in a quantity called joules, 
and power is uh, measured in a quantity called joules per second, right? So it's just like meters is distance and meters per second is velocity. Joules is energy and joules per second is power. But we rename joules per second into a new thing that we call watts. So anytime you hear a unit of watt, you need to think joules per second. Now, energy itself can come in different forms. You can have kinetic energy when something is moving really, really fast or even really slow. It'll have different amounts of energy of motion when it's slams into something, it can do some work knocking down bowling pins, for instance. Or you can have a rubber band, which is potential energy. It's, it's not doing much, but when you let it go, it has the potential to do work. Or raising yourself up on a ladder gives you more gravitational potential energy. These are all different types of energy, but they're all a quantity that is measuring how much work you can do eventually with it. So energy is how much work you can do, and power is how fast you're doing it. Here's a cool question for you. If you're inside of an elevator and that elevator begins to fall from a multi-story building, ah, you're falling. Can you, at the moment of impact with the ground, can you jump off the bottom of the elevator and spare your life and have no injury by jumping right before the elevator hits the ground? Well, the answer to this is unless you're absolutely superhuman, no, you're not going to be able to avoid injury or death and falling from a very tall elevator. And here's the main reason why. When you're falling inside of an elevator, the elevator is falling at so many meters per second and it's accelerating the whole time. You are inside of the elevator and you are also falling down at exactly the same rate as the elevator because gravity is affecting you both. So when you're inside the elevator, you are basically in free fall and for all practical purposes, you are going to feel weightless inside of that elevator while it's falling. So problem number one that you're going to have is you're going to have a hard time jumping anyway because if you're in free fall in the center of the elevator, literally floating like an astronaut, you won't have your feet planted on the ground ready to spring up and actually jump. It's going to be very hard to effectuate a jump like that when you're floating in the middle of the elevator. So what will actually happen is the bottom of the elevator will hit the ground and then you will then fall down inside the elevator and splat against the bottom. Now let's say you were prepared for this. You strapped your feet to the bottom, you're weightless, but you're attached to the bottom, you're ready to spring up and jump. All right, you're still not gonna have a good day because your muscles only have so much energy and even the strongest human can only jump a tiny fraction of the velocity as compared to the velocity of that elevator coming down. If you're in a multi-story building, everything's accelerating at almost 10 meters per second squared. And so that means you and the elevator are going to be traveling at tens of meters per second upon impact. So the only way to actually avoid injury is if you could jump up with the same velocity as the elevator is falling down at the moment of impact. And there is no way that human muscles can generate that kind of energy to jump. Even the world athlete, triathlete, Olympian would never be able to jump high enough, fast enough to counteract the downward velocity to be able to then gently set back down on the ground at zero meters per second. It's just not possible. All of that combined with you not knowing exactly when to jump because you can't see outside basically means unfortunately you're going to hit the ground. But modern elevators have numerous safety systems to clamp the elevator and slow it down so that this never happens. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.